I remember the first time I rode a tuk-tuk in India. It was like nothing I have ever experienced before. There appeared to be virtually no road rules, no sense of order, and the diref- direction of traffic appeared optional. The use of the traffic horn was less of an aggressive siren or a safety measure and more of a look out I am coming through. Commuting through the streets of India felt chaotic and oddly exciting. Looking around, it felt like my entire understanding of how the road rules worked was completely flipped upside down. See, you and I are living in an ever-changing, fast-moving, evolving world. I wonder, have you ever experienced the shock of your world feeling like it has been flipped upside down? Maybe something has happened in your life, a promotion at work, the loss of a loved one, a move to a new city, a falling out with a friend, and this has left your life, whether you like it or not, completely different. Today, as we read God's word for us, we are going to read some of Jesus' words that literally flipped the teacher of the laws and the Pharisees' whole understanding of their world upside down and also transforms our lives and hearts today. Over the past few weeks, we have been journeying through our Lent series, I Have Come To, exploring the purposes of Jesus' mission on earth in his very words. Jesus says, I have come to bring the good news of the kingdom of God. I have come to save and bring salvation to all. And I have even come to bring division between families and communities through commitment and love for him. Which brings us to our word for us, a word from God for us today, where Jesus says, I have come to fulfill. But before we jump into this, will you pray with me? Heavenly Father, um, we thank you that um, whilst we do live in an ever-changing and fast-paced world, Um, I thank you, Lord, that we can trust in your name, Jesus. I thank you that you tell us that your word is alive and active and has a purpose and a message for us today. And Holy Spirit, I just pray that um, as we uh, dive into Jesus' words for us today, Lord, that you would just reveal what these words mean to us, what they mean for our lives. Um, But not just on a cognitive level, I pray, Lord, that um, the Holy Spirit would really speak to our hearts um, And that, yeah, you would reveal more of who you are and and what this means for our lives for us today. So, yeah, I just pray that um, anything that is not from your word, God, would just pass away. um, And that ultimately that you would be lifted up and glorified for who you are through this time of teaching, I pray. Amen. So, um, Jesus is preaching his first sermon of his ministry, the Sermon on the Mount. And Jesus has just finished sharing the vision statement of God's kingdom the Beatitudes, and this is where he goes on um, to say to the crowd, and we're reading from Matthew chapter 5, verse 17 to 20. These are the words of Jesus. He says, Do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. For truly I tell you, until heaven and earth disappear, not the smallest letter Not the least stroke of a pen will by any means disappear from the law until everything is accomplished. Therefore, anyone who sets aside one of the least of these commands and teaches others accordingly will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever practices and teaches these commands will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I tell you that unless your righteousness surpasses that of the Pharisees and the teachers of the law, you will certainly not enter the kingdom of heaven. Whew, that's a lot. But before we unpack what Jesus means in this radical piece of teaching, we first need to go through some very key definitions. Firstly, what does Jesus mean by the law and what does he mean by the prophets? So what is the law? Because Jesus is not referring to our Western understanding of the law today. Jesus isn't talking about the Australian constitution or enforcing of road rules or even seeking penalty for crimes. No, Jesus is talking about the Hebrew word for law here, which many of you would know is Torah. The Torah is God's teaching, instruction or commandments to his people. The first 10 are pretty famous. You might have heard of them. God reveals these first 10 commandments to Moses on Mount Sinai and these are considered so important that he actually asked Moses to write them out in stone. But there are also 603 other commandments that God gives gives his people 
And these are found in something called the Pentateuch, which, um, which is the first five books of the Bible, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. So um, we read in Exodus that God saved uh, the Israelites out of slavery in Egypt, and then he gave them these instructions. See, the law outlined the way of living in right relationship with God in response to God's redeeming act of the Exodus. So we have to realize that the law was the heart and soul of the Jews' scriptures. It's where they went to find God's will and practical uh, instructions on how to live a God-honoring life. The law outlined how people should act in all sorts of everyday situations, how they relate to God, how they treat others, what they should eat, what they should wear, how they should clean themselves, how, how they should go about a business transaction, etc., and etc. The law was their guiding and ultimate authority their lifeblood of their community. In fact, it was their whole way of life, of breathing, of relating. It was the lens in which they saw their world. The law was a blessing, blessing for God's people. It guided them and protected them from harm. I wonder, has anyone here um, ever read through Psalm 119, the longest psalm in the whole Bible? This is essentially a psalm of thanksgiving for the law, the word of God to his people. But the law also acknowledged what hu that humans could and would not follow the law properly and even explained what the high priests in the community would do to repent of the people's inability to follow the law. In addition, the law helped the Israelites to live out God's character in their world, to reflect God's image and ensure they were set apart from the nations around them. In Exodus chapter 19, um, verses 3 to 6, um, we read the following. Then Moses went up to God and the Lord called him to the mountain and said, This is what you are to say to the descendants of Jacob and what are you, you are to tell the people of Israel. You, yourselves, you, you yourselves have seen what I did to Egypt and how I carried you on eagles' wings and brought you to myself. Now, if you obey me fully and keep my covenant, then out of all the nations you will be my treasured possession." Although, although the whole earth is mine, you will be a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. So if we think of the commandments, God instructs his people not to lie. But this is actually because that he himself is a trustworthy God. God instructs his people not to commit adultery because he himself is faithful. With all this background and contextual knowledge about the law under our belts, let's continue by now asking, what did Jesus mean by the prophets? There is so much information that could be shared about the prophets in the Bible. But really simply, these were ordinary people and priests who were chosen by God to be messages from God to his people and the surrounding nations. They would often bring messages of judgment and encouragement to people to repent of their sin, often in inspiring and passionate ways. But the key point here is that the prophets like Isaiah, Amos, Micah, and more in the Old Testament. See, they always encourage the Israelites to go back to faithfully following the Torah, often after they were found worshipping other gods or living in sin. And secondly, the prophets pointed towards the hope that the Messiah would bring when, they, when the Messiah came to bring complete judgment and salvation. So here's the thing, when Jesus makes a crazy claim, I have come to fulfill the law and the prophets, we start to grasp how truly shocking this claim is. See, Jesus is not only saying that he has the same authority of the Torah and the prophets. Moreover, he is claiming that he is the very king and promise that they point to. Let me explain it in this way. See, the law and the prophets anticipated the arrival of the Messiah who would bring the kingdom of God. Jesus' life and ministry brings the kingdom of God and fulfills the law and prophets by bringing into being, into living being, what was being anticipated. And this is the kind of statement that makes the teachers of the law and the Pharisees' blood boil. We have to keep in mind that the Pharisees had been diligently studying and memorizing the whole Torah their whole lives. They were absolute experts in the law. Tim Keller refers to the Pharisees as professional holy guys. So Jesus' claim that he has the authority of the law and is the living, breathing fulfillment of the law 
literally flips their whole belief system, outlook and way of life upside down. And we read that this claim infuriates and insults them so much that they actually go on to plot to kill Jesus. Scholars and Bible experts have long debated what the Hebrew word for fulfill, which is pleralo, means in this context. A biblical definition could be to complete, to bring into effect, to bring into realization or to finish. But to truly understand what Jesus is saying here, I think we need to first return back to some of the key points in history of God's people. See, the passage I read out earlier from Exodus 19, um, God refers to the original covenant that God first promised to someone called Abraham back in Genesis 12. And God then reminds Moses of this exact promise, what we refer to as the old covenant that he made with the Israelites, that they would be a holy priesthood, a nation set apart for God's glory. But if we actually keep reading on from Exodus 19, we read generations and generations of stories which outline how miserably God's people fail to follow the Torah. They stuff up a lot. There is a lot of conflict with other nations. Chuck in a few dodgy um, kings and judges in there and eventually God's people end up living and suffering as exiles in Babylon with their family members murdered, their land taken and their temple destroyed. And it is at this point, it is here in this suffering and despair where God makes a new game changing promise to his people. And we find this in Jeremiah chapter 31. The days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the people of Israel and the people of Judah. It will not be like the covenant I made with their ancestors when I took them by the hand and led them out of Egypt because they broke my covenant, though I was a husband to them, declares the Lord. This is the covenant I will make with the people of Israel after that time, declares the Lord. I will put my law in their minds and write it on their hearts. I will be their God and they will be my people. No longer will they teach their neighbor to say to one another, know the Lord because they will all know me from the least of them to the greatest, declares the Lord. For I will forgive their wickedness and will remember their sins no more. Here God is saying that he is going to fulfill and restore the old shattered covenant and replace and fulfill it with a new relationship and a new covenant. See, the law will no longer need to be written out on stones. It will be written on his people's hearts. I will be their God and he will be my people. The fractured relationship between God and his people from the old covenant will be healed and restored. See, Jesus isn't going to wait For a human priest to make sacrifices for the sins of the people like the Lord details, he himself will be the ultimate sacrifice, the firstborn lamb of God without blemish. What does Jesus say to his disciples the night before his death on the cross when he shares in the Passover meal? We read this verse almost always when we celebrate communion. In Luke 22, we read Jesus says, this is the cup. This cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is poured out for you. The new covenant sees our sin forgiven and the law and prophets fulfilled through the blood of Jesus. In verse 20 of chapter 5 in our passage today, Jesus says, For I tell you that unless your righteousness surpasses that of even the Pharisees and the teachers of the law, you will certainly not enter the kingdom of heaven. See, Jesus knows that it is solely through the perfect righteousness of his life, death and resurrection, that one can live out God's will better than that of a professional holy guy. As Tim Keller articulates in his sermon podcast, The Grace of the Law, he says this, he says, Jesus is the Sermon on the Mount. Jesus says, I came to fulfill, I came to be the person you should be so you could receive my perfect righteousness as a gift. See, the law doesn't just show you your sin, it shows you your saviour. 
And it is through Jesus' great act of forgiveness on the cross, God's people no longer have to follow the law out of compulsion or fear or legalism or because it is the governing authority. No, they will follow the law because of a supernatural transformation, renovation of the human heart. Out of, they will naturally obey God's commands out of love for Jesus rather than compulsion or ritual. Edmund Clowney, in his book, How Jesus Fulfills the Ten Commandments, he says this, When Jesus comes, the law takes on a different meaning and function. Jesus fulfilled the law then, not simply by obeying it, but by transforming it. Jesus calls you and I, his disciples, to continue to to fulfill the, the Torah by allowing him to transform our hearts. And I think there is a reason that Jesus begins his Sermon on the Mount with this outrageous claim that he fulfills the law, because it is through this understanding that we actually understand the rest of his sermon. And I really encourage and implore you, if you get the chance this week to read through Matthew chapter 5 to 7, Jesus outlines various commands from the law, and then he actually goes on to expose how the command or the action is underpinned by the attitude of one's heart. For example, in Matthew chapter 5, verse 27, Jesus said, says, You have heard that it was said, you shall not commit adultery. But I tell you that anyone who looks at a woman lustfully has already committed adultery with her in his heart. See, we as followers of Jesus no longer follow the commands from the Torah and the sermon, or the Sermon on the Mount out of, out of old covenant ritual or legalism. We actually follow it as an outflow and expression of our love for Jesus, as the lived application of the fulfillment of the law and a transformed heart. So if this is the case, if Jesus has fulfilled the law and the prophets and brought the new covenant and this transforms the human heart, does that mean that the law and the prophets aren't actually relevant to us today? Does that mean maybe I can gloss over or rip out the first half of my Bible? Maybe solely focus on the New Testament? Maybe I can even skip my Old Testament class at Bible college? Well, let's return to Jesus' words from Matthew 5 again, expressed this time through the message version. Jesus says, Don't suppose for a minute that I have come to demolish the scriptures, either God's law or the prophets. I'm not here to demolish, but to complete. I'm going to put it all together. Trivialize even the smallest item in God's law and you will only have trivialized yourself. But take it seriously. Show the way for others and you will find honor in the kingdom. Jesus is pretty clear here that he has not come to control, alt, delete the law. Rather, Jesus speaks of the importance of the law and the prophets and the respect and reverence they deserve. And whilst the role of the law is now different to what it was through the fulfillment and completion that Jesus' blood brings, here's the thing, guys. The law, the scriptures, they still have a purpose for us today. We should spend time reading it, reflecting on it, absorbing it, studying it and living it out. You and I have so much to learn from the words of the Torah and from the prophets. There is so much for us to reflect on about God, his character and his relationship with his people. The law paints a beautiful picture for us of the kingdom of God, a world where there is no slander, no lust, no murder, no unfaithfulness. It instead provides us with a picture of God's shalomatic and sovereign character and will. See, the Torah uh, remains a statement of God's will until everything is accomplished, until Jesus returns to earth for the second time. A little illustration to drive this point home. So when I was in high school, um, I played the French horn. You may not know what that is. Um, It's basically like a trumpet, tuba, brass instrument type thing and um, I don't mean to brag but um, if you look at the photo on the screen that's me at the 2013 South Australian Music Camp uh, where I was third horn Um, and if you look closely at the photo you might even see a picture of my husband Liam holding a saxophone somewhere in there 
Um, you know, some guys might buy girls flowers or chocolates to flirt and get out of the friend zone, but no, my husband signs up to state band camp. So anyway, um, <laughs> when I was uh, first starting out, my French one teacher would make me practice and practice my major and minor scales with the aim of improving my pitch, my range, my embouchure, my finger dexterity on the keys. But I used to absolutely hate playing scales. In fact, I would avoid and procrastinate practicing them. And then at the start of every session, my teacher, whose communication style I would describe as blunt, uh, used to yell at me uh, for my lack of diligence and persistence with my practice. But as the years went on and my skills improved on the French horn, do you think I exclusively played C or D major scales over and over and over again when I played in orchestra and stage band? No, of course not. I mean, I occasionally played scales to warm up, but the role and the purpose of the scales changed. All those hours and hours of scale practice were fulfilled by enabling me to then be able to play the stunning horn solo in Rhapsody in Blue or in the Bach movements and perform in beautiful concert halls and ensembles. The scales in this analogy is, of course, the law. The blood of Jesus may have transformed the role of the law for us today, but it doesn't mean we aren't to study it, learn from it, meditate on it, and live it out. Tim Mackey, in his podcast, Jesus and the Torah, which is a great uh, listen if you get the time throughout the week, he says this, he says, The 613 commands in the Torah were God's will for the Israelites and were good for that time and place and are still good today, but have now been fulfilled through Jesus. And now we are going to play the music of the law with our lives. See, we, you and I, are the Jeremiah 31 people. So as we approach Easter next week, I wonder, are you struggling with your own failure to live out God's commands? Has your own striving for righteousness left you feeling empty or unfulfilled? Do you need to simply rest in the righteousness that Jesus' blood brings? Are you perhaps still living in the confines of the old covenant, like the Pharisees, trying to work towards your own righteousness through following rules, ticking boxes, serving on ministry teams because it's, you feel like it's what you should be doing to keep up appearances? But perhaps if we cut deeper, the intentions behind your actions are more legalistic than loving. I wonder, do you need Jesus to transform your heart today? In this moment now, do you need to desperately call out to Jesus and ask, write the law on my heart, Jesus. Renovate and renew my heart. Lord, help me to follow your commands, not out of compulsion, but out of a transformed heart in love with you. I wonder, does anyone know what today is in the Lent calendar, the Sunday before Easter? It's Palm Sunday. It's the day which celebrates Jesus' entry into, into Jerusalem, met with the praises of the people and palms laid down in, in his path in worship and reverence of him. As Jesus rode into Jerusalem on a donkey five days before he went to the cross, I doubt the Pharisees, the crowds, or even his own disciples realized the significance of what he was about to do. Jesus was on his way to complete all that the Torah and the prophets had been pointing to for hundreds of years to bring the kingdom of God. And just as Jesus rode on his donkey, we, the Jeremiah 31 people, freed in the new covenant with transformed hearts, we are to jump on our own donkeys and travel out to our own Jerusalems, our schools, our workplaces, our homes, our unis, to bring the kingdom of God and the good news of Jesus. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. We are to keep doing this until Jesus returns a second time to earth, until the earth fades and the stars burn out, and Jesus fulfills the law and the prophets forevermore. And this sounds oddly like RBC's third value, everyone living out God's mission. See, you and I, we all have a donkey to jump on and a part to play in renewing God's world. 
the other day I um, uh, went out to dinner with a friend from work uh, who would probably identify herself as an agnostic. The conversation took a deeper turn and she shared um, about a recent relationship breakup and, and she said this, she said, Esther, I just feel like something in my life is missing. Like a piece of the puzzle is missing, but I actually just don't know what the piece is. I keep searching and searching and no matter what happens, I feel empty. Well, I tell you, it took every ounce of self-control within me to not literally scream in her face, Jesus, it's Jesus. Perhaps I should have. Um, But instead, I said a silent prayer in my head that the Holy Spirit would give me an opportunity to share the gospel with grace to her. And praise God, I was able to share my faith a little bit later on in the conversation. But my work friend is someone who needs the righteousness and fulfillment of Jesus in her life. She needs Jesus to renovate and transform her heart. Indeed, we all need Jesus to do this, every single one of us. I wonder who is your work friend? in your world. Maybe you're uh, listening online today and if you're honest yourself with yourself, you are actually the work friend. Maybe you could pray a prayer in your heart for the first time. Jesus, thank you that your blood fulfills the old covenant of my life, that fulfills my unrighteousness, that brings me life, that brings me freedom. Jesus, transform my heart. I wonder who you could invite along to one of our Easter services next weekend or to Alpha later on in the year or to your life group or to read the Bible with you at a cafe or who you could pray for in the storeroom at work. I wonder, will you pray for me? Pray with me today as I close. Let's pray. Dear Jesus, thank you so much. Thank you so much for coming to earth, dying on the cross to forgive our wickedness and to remember our sins no more. Thank you that we, the Jeremiah 31 people, now live in the freedom of your new covenant through your blood poured out for us. This Easter, Jesus, we thank you for coming to earth to fulfill and complete the law and the promises of hope from the prophets that the old covenant pointed to for hundreds of years. I thank you that we don't have to rely on our own failing sense of righteousness, but we can rest and completely receive your perfect righteousness, Jesus. We thank you for the blessing that your word and your law is to us and how it paints a picture of who you are. And we, we pray that we would be followers of you who live out your commands from a heart devotion response. Jesus, we pray against following your law to tick a box or out of ritual tradition. And we pray now, Jesus, that you would come and you would, through your Holy Spirit, transform and renovate our hearts. Help us to continue to live out your mission in this world. Help us to get on our donkeys and go out to our Jerusalems, wherever that may be. Lord, we lift to you those people in our lives, our work friends, uh, who desperately need you in their lives and who are perhaps searching for fleeting things in this world to fulfill them. Lord, I pray that they would experience an encounter with their savior, Jesus, this Easter. I pray. I pray for our Easter services here at Ross Trevor next week. I pray for those who may be coming along to church for the first time, Lord, that you would speak to them, speak to their hearts, transform their hearts for the very first time. I pray, Lord Jesus, I pray all these things in your beautiful name. Amen.